Hi, my name is Megan. I'm the greenhouse manager here at Plant Delights Nursery. I am going to be really dorked out today because I love infrastructure. And if you're looking to put up a greenhouse, we're going to talk about a couple different types, cold frames, and then we're going to talk about the warm frames. This is where you need to start. And there's some basic principles that you're going to have to apply to a whole lot of diff different situations in your yard, in your setting, and your environment that you want to put some things up. So I'm happy to talk about that. There are some uh, semi-permanent greenhouses. Often you see them like in strawberry fields where they're putting up those little rows that go over that. I'm not going to do that today, uh, mostly because we grow perennials. So I want to show you my infrastructure and how to work from there. So if you would be so kind as to follow me this way, I've got a whole bunch of examples to talk about. So from just walking around the property, do any of you know now which way is west? Perfect. And that is east. That's one of the big first determining barriers that you're going to need to be able to think through in order to put up a really good greenhouse frame. Now sometimes the width of your yard or your ability to get machines in and out if you're going to have a big greenhouse is going to change the way you're going to turn the direction. Sometimes the direction is going to be more for actually being able to work with the infrastructure and bring things in and out or have water at the appropriate place versus the actual sunlight. So we're going to start with the sunlight now and what I want to show you is these first houses up here. That's west, that's east. These are all north-south facing houses. All right. And when you think about it, all of these houses through here don't have any cover. They don't have any tree cover and if it's rising from here and the sun's going all the way over them, you're going to get full sun all day. In fact, that was such an important factor that we bought these special shade cloths, which I'll talk through in a minute, in order to be able to keep the temperature down in these houses. If you have a house that's facing east-west, you're going to have an entirely different light consideration. So if you look at that big house right here, greenhouse one, that's an east-west facing house. So you know that for the most part, even though we have a shade cloth on it, you can actually put plants that require sunlight more in the morning and they want to have a cooler system up in the front of that east part of the house and you can put things that like that hot temperature in the back. We can also roll up the sides and make sure that we have one side shade and one side not. But we'll talk about that. If you're looking through my greenhouses, when you're setting up your groundwork, the ground structure is super important. There is a bunch of formulas that I have a printout. I'd be happy to go and get to a few if you guys are all that interested. Now talk about the width length of the hoops with the size of the hoops and where they need to go in order to have a structurally sound greenhouse. And a lot of times when you're buying things that are offline, that are ready made, they're not thinking about North Carolina occasionally gets a hurricane. You know, North Carolina you know, gets all those winds. So when you're thinking about that, think about your area. You know, if you're down in Florida, totally different greenhouse shape because you're going to get a lot more of those big summer storms and they're going to actually push the structure around. And that structure is going to be just completely dependent on how much pressure that plastic can take. There's ways that we can actually mitigate the, how much pressure and wind that the plastics can actually take and I'll show you that in a minute. But first think about your ground. So we got direction, now we got your grounds. We're thinking about, all right, how, what kind of our weather are we going to have? That'll change what you're going to buy. And then you want to look at the flooring. So a lot of greenhouses actually do not prefer what we have here, which is ground cloth. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll run gravel through here. No matter what you choose, and each of them have very different benefits and very different drawbacks, um, no matter what you have, the entire floor of the greenhouse should be level. If you're on a hill that can be a problem, but it should be level and we should actually have at least, I'm going to say at least five inches of gravel all the way across the bottom. And depending on how you're watering, you want to have an outward trench. So if you look at mine, I've actually got the irrigation heads running over basically two rows. 
All right, so that means that most of my water, and I am actually on a slope here when we're fixing that. So this, we actually have a slope that's starting to go uh, towards the east right now. Each of my greenhouses is mostly going to have the water pool up in the middle. And when you have water pooling anywhere, whether it be in plastic folds or whether it be on the ground, you're only going to increase the probability for disease and or slippage and or liverwort, which is terrible. So what we've done is we've actually dug a, a deeper ditch. So we got the whole thing level, got five inches, and then in the middle, we've made these little curvatures of gravel. Or you can put in a French drain that's a little more expensive. Uh, we've got them in a couple of the houses down there. And then we've got the water that runs out, and you'll see it gets the parking lot wet through here. That way that no matter how much water I'm doing, I'm actually able to control the water in the house. That becomes really, really important for times like the fall, especially if you have a cold frame. So diseases come at different times. They come at different temperatures. And if you're gonna have a cold frame, like our hosta house that we'll visit, or all of our um, primroses, for example, you get something called um, botrytis. Little white mold, likes the cold, definitely likes dead plant material. Well, if the inside of your house is staying too wet because you don't have that drainage, all of those diseases are going to peripherate. You're also going to have a lot more of fungus gnats and things if your floor can't dry out. So it's important to think about that basic groundwork before you get going. Um, when you're actually putting up the house, how you put up the frame depends on how you actually want to be able to put up plastic. Sometimes you're going to be able to buy a full plastic house or an actual, oh God forbid, a glass house. Oh my goodness, I know. Or uh, we have a gutter connect house with, that's two houses in one with, oh, those are really cool too. Uh, I don't have that here, but I do have a number of different methods for being able to cover these guys. And you can see, this is called the quick connect. This is the clips that go on here. These quick connects are really nice. They come off in one direction, off this little lip here, and they go back on the rail systems that we've already attached to the house. Now, those work really nice, and I like them because it allows me to modify during the summer period, not having to spend the extra labor putting all of these little tiny clips around this rainbow ring, but rather being able to negotiate putting the shade cloth up, okay? So those can be very nice. The other ones are called wiggle wires. And I will come back to you. Uh, the wiggle wires actually have a trench and the wire looks like a number of little tiny squares. And when you're putting that on, you actually can get a better tension for winds and for storms, but it's a lot more work and it's a lot more upkeep. When you do that, you set the wiggle wire. If, if anyone wants to see, I can take you down to the houses that I have them on. And you coil them in as you're walking along the side of the greenhouse so that you're actually capping that wire down. And you've got two points for most wiggle wires. You're going to have it all the way down here, and you're going to have it on the mid-beam here. Oh, where's my mid-beam? It's there, it's on the other side. <laughs> and once that happens, you actually can bring that plastic down and have it hold true. What's important to remember is that if you're having a cold frame or a hot frame, you're going to have to adjust it for every season. All right. So if you have a hot frame like this one, we actually have, if you look, I'm so excited. Okay, let's go in a house we're not supposed to. If you look, not only do I have the sides open, so we've taken the plastic up so I get airflow this way, but really important is that hole there. And there's a bunch of them. They're called chimneys. So this, with this shade cloth, is still one of the hottest houses on the property. And that's why we have the agave and the mangabe in here. So you've got airflow from one side. You typically want to get it, if you have a heater, from one direction to the other, basically towards our big fans. If heat comes in and that fan's not running, it goes out the chimney. Helps keep this much cooler in here and you want to be able to modify the temperature for almost everywhere. If you're doing a production house, I can show you those in a minute, it's an entirely different setup because production houses should stay around 75 degrees. That's what you want to kind of keep the soil temperature out. Um, when you have adult plants, you've got a little more leeway, uh, but this actually really helps cool down the house. For the shade cloths, 
Yes. So again, there's and uh, you can feel you said this house is really nice. Yeah, yeah. If you feel that <clears throat> I am doing actually passive cooling. Passive cooling is when I've got the sides open, I've got chimneys, even though I still have fans. That means I'm relying on the outside ambient temperature to be able to cool off the floor of the house, especially after we water. If you're doing active cooling, which we do on our Hellebore houses and Greenhouse 5, which has got all of our woodland peonies and things, we actually keep the sides all the way down, even though we want them to be some of the coolest houses on the property, and we rely solely on fans. And let me show you what that looks like. Oh, thank you, man. <coughs> So this is a house, if you'll see, I do have the ends off it, which is okay because I do have the number of fans in here. But this house is going to be an actively cooled house. I've got the plastic all the way down and look how many fans I have. So what I'm doing is I've correlated, that's where the heater is, that's where we're gonna be able to do the airflow, especially against the exhaust fan. Heater on one side, exhaust fan on the other. And we have all these fans in here in order to draw as much air as possible through a tunnel rather than having the ambient coolant because if you actually have a door open or you have sides open when that fan comes on a lot of times what will happen is the wind will come right in through here right back out yeah. so it's not actually cooling the house so when you keep plastic up and you have the sides down you can actually force cooling and that's really smart so if you're thinking about what direction you want to put your greenhouse you can put your fan, or pardon me, uh, put your cooling fan on the outside. So if you've got a tree line like this, for example, you want the fan to be on the other side of that tree line because it's going to draw all the cool air, all that wow. shaded air through the house. And it's going to be much easier for you to control what you're doing and how you're keeping temperature. You can also put a cooling wall in, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, but that's good. While we're walking by, though, we just plastered a couple houses. Do you remember that? white plastic or the white well, shade cloth I had on over here. <clears throat> this is a different shade cloth. This is called a luminette. And if you look closely at it, it's not only doing that, they made it crinkly. So you know how you can make a layer in between something like a double pane window and you can keep things either hot or colder? That's what this does. It costs an arm and a leg, but I love it. If you're looking for temperature control, this is wonderful. The installation can be difficult. You don't really want to pull this too tight. If you pull it too oh, tight, you lose, you your, lose the wrinkles. Yeah, wrinkles. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you put it in, you want to be able to put it in loosely. And that is incredibly important. When you're looking at how these houses are, you'll see that I've got some, do you remember in that agave house we were just in, I had two bars, one at the bottom and one up here. Yeah. Well, this one has just this bottom bar. And that's because we're gonna treat this as a cold frame. When you're treating something as a cold frame, it means that I'm not planning on turning on heat unless it gets really warm and then it's going to get cold again all of a sudden. So you warm up, the plants are like, hey, this is great, I'm going to start growing. And then it gets cold again and you're like, no, you guys are not going to get frost burned. We're going to keep you warm. What you end up doing is you take this plastic and you roll it up right against this bar here and you use the same kind of batting strip. I'm going to bat and strip around here. Uh, it's the same kind of batten stripping here. So you roll the plastic up, you put some batten strip down, and then if it's going to get cold, you come back out, pop off that batten strip, roll the plastic all the way down, use your clips or use your wiggle wire and get the environment back set up. So if you wanted to put a heater in a cold frame after it's already warmed up and your plants are in active growth and you don't want any damage, most plants can take it. Our hostas houses are the same way. They could truly take a warm winter than a cold winter, but we want them to be as beautiful as possible. <laughs> so when they wake up a little early, it's Sleeping Beauty and she gets her coffee and she gets a little heater and then they look absolutely wonderful. So changing a warm frame that you're going to um, work with to a cold frame can rely just on being able to move these edges up and down, um, which makes it really convenient because that means you're using the same piece of plastic 
um, over and over again. And that means that you can actually control the environment a little more. It's a little more labor and it also takes a little foresight. Um, you guys have grown enough plants. I know that all of you have been constantly <clears throat> watching the weather. Yep. Yeah, you grow plants, you watch yep. the weather. So it makes it really easy to make those adjustments so that you can actually take a frame that you want to be cold and all of these plants in here need a cold chill or they will die. They have to have that winter cold. So I can't keep this blocked off all winter. Just the sun alone would probably warm the house up a little too much and I wouldn't get good perennialization on some things. So being able to make that little adjustment is amazing. Let me show you what a cooling wall looks like. So cooling walls can work in two ways. This one is an automated cooling wall, but you can actually do this yourself by doing active cooling. And that is great for when you have those bizarre hot days where your greenhouses are getting so hot that you can't actually control the temperature. Come on in guys, these guys are the coolers. So when you're trying to keep a house cool, so this one is our tropical house. It will never go below 75, okay? And sometimes it gets to 72, but really it stays at 75. When I mean it stays at 75, I mean it stays at 75. That's what those walls are for. And what we're doing is we're working with a number of different crops in here. So again, here's the west, here's the east. That is that holly head. Okay, the one that's running all the way, see the shade on there? See that row over there? That's thinking through a greenhouse. All of those are little tiny baby seedlings and they need sun, don't get me wrong. But if I put them in North Carolina sun in July and August over here on that south wall, north wall, they are not gonna be happy. So we actually move things and you can see we put them from here and when they start to get bigger, they move right into this bench. Now we've changed the sun dynamic and we're using the whole space appropriately for the environment that we already have created for the plants. So it's easy to put up a greenhouse, but thinking through that time, thinking through the season, takes just a little bit more. The cooling walls work this way. I actually have a pump in here. They pump water and my, my kiddos are old, so don't judge. They pump water up here and all of these fins drip the water down, and you see my fan in the back? It's actually drawing air from here through there, evaporative cooling. Keeps the house exactly where I want it. I wanna watch the temperature in this house especially. Um, I've got some great amorphophallus in here. We never want them to be cold. We also want, don't want them to be too hot, especially because we've got other things that don't wanna be too hot. For this, when I get these set up, I truly like to make a program of cleaning. And for me, I just use bleach. And I use one cup of bleach for my 15 gallons of water, which recirculates, which means I only have to do it about once every eight weeks. Okay, so that works well. It mostly keeps mo all this mold off. Um, this is wonderful because they're old and they've been running all summer. You can do the same thing that these guys are doing, but it, the temperature drop will only last about one to two hours. And that's by doing a manual cool down. So your house is hot, you're worried about your plants, it's the middle of the day, you can't change the plastic because otherwise you won't be prepared for winter. If you walk through with your hose and you take that hose and you spray just under the benches, right? Now we've got that good drainage, remember? You spray just under the benches, that same evaporative cooling is gonna happen in your house too. So you don't have to have a whole lot of expensive equipment, but sometimes you are going to have to take mitigating steps to be able to negotiate the environment and what's going on in your houses. Let's come this way. I've got so much to talk about. So while I have heaters in all of the houses in here, because I wanna make sure everything can stay beautiful. You don't necessarily need a heater. It depends on what you're trying to do and what kind of crop you're trying to have. For example, in Greenhouse 26, which is my far one on the corner, I don't heat anything. That's where I'm gonna keep my trillium. It's where I'm gonna keep my peonies. It's 
It's where I'm going to keep anything that I could keep in an open bed. You can freeze all year round. We need the airflow, and the only reasons you would sort of put up a side or put up any sort of barrier is from pests because those squirrels get hungry, and I swear if they get into my peony crop and eat those roots, I just, mm, or they like to bury nuts in there. We have a, a yeah. pistachio, yeah, they put the pistachio nuts in there. Uh, but if you are thinking about getting a heater, I've got three different types on the property that I'd like to show you. Some of them have some benefits, some of them have others. Um, the first heater that we have is gonna be one of these LB White Guardians. The LB White Guardians are actually meant to be mounted outside the greenhouses. When we got them, uh, we actually had the whole premise set up for what's called a Modine heater, and those were internal heaters. So the LB Whites means that they are for mostly agriculture. So they're going to release a little more ethanol, a little methane, and some of the plants can be sensitive to it. So the normal heater setup, as you can see, I've got a huge vent and intake on the outside here. Well, we've got a bunch of trays. So this stays open all winter. And when the heater's running, this is the big air draw that's going up. This is also fun because before you start up any of the heaters, I highly recommend that you check for wrens because they love building nests in little tiny areas. If you're from North Carolina, you know they're in your garage, they're everywhere. Um, you want to make sure that's clear because this is a great place for them to nest during the summer. And then the heater then is going to point this way and you see again heater this way when I put fans in here all the fans will point this way, blow the heat all the way through the house and then I've got the big exhaust fans, what we call the louver fans there on the back. That's what we want to do. We're going to try to push it around. <clears throat> for some of the houses that don't have the really long ones, like Greenhouse 4, that's that big one right here. You can see I've only got one heater in the front. Now to mitigate heating a house that big, I line the fans up pointing from the heater down to the back of the house, and at the other end, I turn the fans around the other direction. So what I'm trying to do is get the heat to circulate from one side of the house and come back on the other. Mm -hmm. And what you're gonna see is, um, Yes, come on out. That, that, that's where I want to go. Oh, right yes, ma'am. Um, when you're walking through these houses, there's always going to be a spot that you're going to have to check for temperature if you do want to keep it warm. Let me check that out. So again, for this one, let's just pretend it's a jig house. We're going to put all the fans, the ones just like on the other scenes, they're going to point all the way down this way. And then when we get to the side, this back row here, all the fans are going to point this way. And when you get there, it's that turning point, that very back corner, that's going to have the most problems with consistency and heat, and also with cooling. That's where you want to hang your temperature meter. And here's mine here. Yes, so a lot of times, these guys, I use a high-low meter which actually has the mercury that runs on both sides and has a little magnetic marker in it. So the marker, here's the mercury that says how cold it's just recently gotten, here's how hot it is today. That's the hottest recorded for the week. I haven't reset these. And you can take a magnet and just pull it down here. It'll pull that blue right back, which means you have the control. If it's going to be super cold, super hot, if things are changing, you can monitor exactly where your greenhouse is. And this is the point. It's on the other side of the row of the heater. So if we're doing a turnaround with any kind of wind, that's where these guys need to go. They're going to give you the best indicator of how the temperature in the greenhouse is sitting. You can put it down here with the plants. I've found that I've gotten better and consistent, more consistent records with having it float approximately three feet right above them. Um, with some that are, I would definitely say you can put them a little lower. So uh, it's also because I want you guys to be able to read the signs when you're in here looking for adoptees. I didn't think about putting shade cloth on the thermometer, which makes sense. Right, because if we get too much sun on there, it's not going to give you an accurate right. reading. That yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When you're building a house or you're situating it, please think about 
what you're going to need. Remember, I was talking about machines. Now, a lot of you guys aren't going to be taking huge golf carts through with baskets to put plants in there. Some of you will probably just be doing annuals, um, which can be a much more loose setup because you're going to plop them in and pull them out real quick. These guys are all set up for perennials. These hang out for me like, you know, years. I'm like, hi. Um, but you're going to need water no matter what. So you've got three options on that. This one is a ground system. They're all done, my ground system and my overhead are all done by Rainbird. Okay, so you can have a ground system with a solenoid, which is a pressurized valve that you can either turn on and off with a ball valve or you can hook up to a computer so you can have it go on a cycle. Um, all of those are interesting. If you guys want to have more information about purchasing these kind of higher end materials, let me know. I'll get you a card at the end of this because it can be a little confusing. Now these guys are set low because of these signs and also because it's one of the earliest houses so I don't have overhead watering in here. Um, <clears throat> but if you notice in every house I always have a hose. So if you're going to build a, a greenhouse, if you buy just one of the Y connectors and I can show it to you, that way you can have a hose and if you just dig a little tiny trench and pop it up in the greenhouse and you can have the hose rack right there, then you can have water at any time and walk the hose wherever it needs to be. Super easy rather than traveling back and forth or using uh, water pails or anything like that. It makes it so much easier and the easier it is, the more you can get done. Time makes plants, time and space. So that's why figuring out what direction your houses are facing, uh, what kind of sunlight they're going to get, what kind of flooring and drainage you're going to have, all of that is saving, saving time and it's making more space for the things that you want to actually grow. Let me show you a couple spinners. Oh, and I was, I'm coming back to the heaters. I just showed you one. I got two more. I'm just so excited. I can't help it. I am. I do my best, but you know, anything that's wrong in here is my fault, and everything that's right is my staff's fault. Oh, gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, they got it. Yeah, you know, if I missed it, that's on me, you know. So a lot of these heads are going to have three different types. Um, some of them have these red spigot heads. If you look closely, and I'm going to be an unladylike lady over here. If you look closely, you can see that little hole right there, and then you can see that hole on that side. Do you see how they're aligned? Okay, so I'm keeping those at a level because I'm actually adjusting how far the spray from each of those heads occurs. If you have a smaller greenhouse, you can actually twist these slightly so that hole would be a little further down. You're going to get a more controlled spray, but a more intense spray. When you actually get these spinners in, it's really useful. If you wanted to do the spinners or you wanted to do any sort of irrigation system, grab yourself five gallon bucket. Turn on your irrigation system, take that bucket and put it over there. When you put it over there, have a timer. When it says one minute, pull it off. See how much water you have. That's going to give you really basic gallons per minute. And that means you're going to be able to adjust. Let's say you want to put a spinner with a smaller hole or a smaller spread, or sometimes we actually unscrew these completely and cap them off for areas that we want to stay dry. That's going to give you the measurement of control for how much you want to water some plants versus how much you want to water others, especially if you're going for an automatic system. Okay, back to heaters. <laughs> no, I like this stuff. This stuff is really cool. There are a lot of places. I know that Modine has a brand new heater. It's called a hot dog. The hot dog runs on electricity. So if you don't have propane lines like I do, you can actually install and mitigate some of that cooling by buying just a different instrument. Um, I do think that they, most of them require a 220 line, um, but the 120 would be okay if you're gonna have a smaller house. So if you're not gonna have houses this big, you can definitely mitigate it, especially if you've got some fans in there and you're doing that air circulation system. You can have a smaller heater and just make sure it doesn't freeze. So that means you're going to try to keep a, a house at maybe 33, 34 degrees, right above freezing. That's optimal. And that's what I have to be able to maintain. Um, if you are a little nervous about it, you can bring it back up to like 35, 36 degrees. And that's going to be, give you a little cushion in case anything goes wrong. 
but yeah. So, um, these heaters with the hoods on yeah. here, these are my new heaters. And I bought these because the plants in here are sensitive to the gases that get released from the LB White Guardians. So, oops, these are, I'm sorry. These are um, also LB Whites, but come on open. They are the, the Grow or the Plant 220 Plus. So for these guys to operate, which is really kind of cool, um, you actually need to have a double system in here. And we can come on in. We still have the exhaust vent, okay, because they're still going to need to intake air, and since they're propane, they're going to be able to burn a flame, all right? So we still have the exhaust system, but on the top there, we have a box that opens and shut. And that box and that little tiny fan at the corner there are linked. So while this is actually engineered so that it will give off less gases, in order for it to do so, both of those exhausts have to work so that we can still clear the house just in case that these plants are so sensitive that they can't take anything extra. Yeah, the cannas and some of the moose that they don't, sometimes they don't like sitting right here, right? So that's why these guys came in. Um, these guys are for actual greenhouse growth. Uh, they can be inside the house versus the guardians that are kind of meant to be outside. But if, like I said, if you show, I showed you the infrastructure, you can get it done. Um, they're also a little more pricey to run. Um, and you've got to have some computer skills to be able to do any work on them. Um, but, you know, you learn as you go. <laughs> So, you know, I was talking about making sure that you know where your hoses are going to run, maybe digging a little trench. Now, if you think about the infrastructure for a greenhouse setup this big, um, I just want to tell you some stories. These are all my regulators. This is all of my propane lines that are running off all these gas tanks. Now, we have golf carts and people and everything traveling through here. I also have three drainage systems that are French drains. I have all of the electrical to run everything um, for all the fans, for all of my alarms. Um, and then I do have a bunch of little alarm lines that run that give me the heads up when things get too hot and cold. Thinking through how you're going to put something in doesn't mean just like, oh, I know the direction or I'm going to do this floor. Think about how you're going to, if you wanted to, run that material. Do you want to run electricity? Great. Get some Schedule 40 PVC figure out if there's a spot in your box, and figure out how far from your box to the greenhouse that you need to run it. Do you want just some outlets out front here, like the way that I have most of the houses? Or do you want to run a line in and have it curtain over so that you can plug in fans in different boxes? So that can be very important. And again, if you, even if you have just a little house that you bought offline, that makes everything so much easier because you just basically plug it in and it's ready to play. You know, and you don't have to do any extra work. You're not dragging extension cords across the yard that you might potentially mow over. You can learn the hard way or you can just take my advice. <laughs> but thinking through all of that, moving into a structure like this, again, the easier it is, the more you're going to want to play in there. And especially if you're understanding this side stays shady, this side stays sunny, you're going to be able to do so much more in any space that you want to create. Um, this is the last heater. And this is an old Modine heater. So you can see, the older the heater that you get, you actually get a, you actually get a chimney on here. That's how much yeah. these guys smoke. Um, these are the ones that I've been slowly replacing. In some houses, like this one, it doesn't matter. They've got basically the same setup, but it's easier to look at and see. So when you're looking for an older heater, even if they're going to smoke a little bit, you're going to see that you've got all of these fans that are out in the front. Um, that's fantastic. On the bottom here, you can swing this door open, and here's where the burners sit. So what happens is the propane comes on, shoots the flame all the way up here, 
and then we've got that fan there and then we'll change that fan around to face this way and that one. So I've got the little circular because this is such a little heater in here um, so that we can heat up the space and actually move the heat. They also have fans in the back so they do blow a little bit just like all of the heaters do. Um, but by setting up that whirlpool and seeing this kind of really basic setup if you find them it's really understand or easy to start to understand heater maintenance and other sorts of issues that can come up because these guys are meant to be worked on versus something that has a computer in it and you have to go and clear codes and command things. So. <coughs> Now I'm talking about heating and cooling and water kind of all at once. Um, that's just to keep you guys on your toes. I'd like to show you something that I don't like to do, but I, we've tried just to see how it works. And that is this venting system. So this house, we've got north, south, the sun comes from the east, this house bakes. Now I've got plants in here that are super water sensitive. So if you look at the spinners, as you walk down, you'll see ball valves turned off <clears throat> so that the back of the house isn't watered at all. Again, you can also just screw in little caps so that those spinners aren't actually working. But this house got so hot that we tried an alternative venting system, which is these side vents. Now if you've got a house with water sensitivity, okay. I kind of don't like it. I haven't seen any difference in the temperature. Um, other people have though, so I think I'm going to do some more experiments. I still like sticking with the standard sides up with chimneys versus having all of these extra vent holes. I just don't, can't see the air moving as well. And if you want to see your air move in your greenhouse and check and see if you're getting the airflow, especially if you've got some um, air sensitive plants, things like lavandula, they're sticky, they want to have that extra airflow. Um, Things that want to actually be breezed out, like our ajuga, because they actually get crown rot if you've got water sitting on the top of them in plastic. In the garden, they're fine, but here for the greenhouses, I'm growing them in pots. It's an entirely different situation. Um, that's why all of this is here. So if you're thinking through how we're going to water and how you're manipulating zones, this house gets really hot. So we tried cutting more holes. Like I said, I haven't seen a difference yet. Okay. Um, yeah, so. So you don't have a shade cloth like on this one like you do These are full because, sun. Because you have to have the sun amount. Yep, yeah. yeah. These guys are full sun. They don't want to cook. Nobody actually wants to be, unless you're from the desert Nevada, nobody really wants to be 115 degrees. They really don't. Like, um, we don't. <laughs> um, so keeping them at a better, you want to come in here? Oh, no, it's okay. I just happen to be in everybody's way today. Yeah, so making those kind of considerations is, is really pretty good. So you got the groundwork to start with. Are you going to choose to put ground cloth down? You can. I like the gravel underneath it because again you're getting the good drainage. The ground cloth provides great weed control but it will eventually get a little slick which means you will have to come through with a, a scrub brush and clean the floors a little bit. The gravel works nice, less weed control but you can walk through and if you wanted to, go ahead and get rid of any weed from the choices that you have that you feel respectable for your greenhouse. Um, it's just a, a really neat thing and I really spend a lot of time out here playing with this infrastructure. So yeah, keeping track of course, so like, like, like I said, where you're putting extra rails, if you're going to have extra rails, how you're going to move the plastic, think through the seasons. Do you want it up? Do you want it down? Um, all of that is very important to have what kind of plants you're growing and what kind of conditions you're trying to keep. <clears throat> the plants have no choice about what you're going to give them right. as soon as you build a, a greenhouse. So choose wisely. Um, if anybody has any questions or if anybody's looking to grow a specific sort of crop, I'd be happy to talk through any of that if you're interested. You don't put a greenhouse on a cement slab. That's not necessarily true, but most of those are production houses that are going into TC labs and they have really big drains. And you've got to have a drain system that's going to get dirt spills, that's going to be able to clean off that floor. Now you can shuffle it off side, 
Um, but when you're shuffling it off, if it dries out a little bit, and let's say you accidentally got some uh, root mealies in there, and you're scooping on the broom, and it's dusty, uh, they're going to come up, yeah. and they're going to find some other place to leave. Yeah. So, <clears throat> oh, which brings me, yes, I, I prefer most greenhouses that never put things directly on the floor. Now, I'm in production, so I'm here to make sure that plant the lights, can support the entire Juniper Level Botanic Garden, all of the wonderful research crew. Like, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. And every time you adopt somebody, yep. that's where it comes from. So I don't really have the room to wiggle. Um, I have seen a lot of trees and shrub um, nurseries that do use frames, put things directly on the floor. I don't sell those. Um, but the ones that I have had directly on the floor, I've been unhappy with. I don't get as good drainage out of the pot which the media in the pot is as important as the media in the bottom of your greenhouse. Um, and I do feel like they tend to be a little more disease prone, um, but I could be biased. Somebody could do it better than me. So, Excuse me. would you ever put a thinner fabric cloth down inside your greenhouse and then put gravel on top of that? To really no, no, I wouldn't. Um, so I would never put a thinner uh, ground cover cloth on and then put more gravel on it. And I'll tell you, if you see all our little patchworks here, yep. I can assure you that this is not the funnest job in the world. Right. Um, so if you've got any rips or tears on that fabric cloth, that means you're going to not only have to rake all of that media off it and then establish a square, right. refold the edges to pin it back down and then scrape all that media off, back on, it just seems like you're doing steps two times. Gotcha rather than just doing it once. Okay. So pick Does your... Does it adversely affect drainage? No. It would not adversely mm -mm, No, I have not seen any difference. As long as the ground on the greenhouse, this, where you're setting it up, the direction you're setting it up, getting all of your infrastructure to it, that's very basic. And then when after you get that done, that means you've actually set up the drainage. Okay. So even if you put a ground cloth over here, and we like to do it because occasionally we have guests coming in in heels right. or yeah. you know the, the big cowboy boots. We want to make sure that they've got a steady platform for when they're viewing the adoptees. Um, this makes it a little better. Uh, the house that you were in with the actual cooling fins, uh -huh. yeah. so that one is a gravel based house. So you saw that there was no ground cloth in there. Um, so that one is hand weeded because we've got a lot of specialty yeah. stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and it's just something to consider. Uh huh. To kind of keep the sun. Yeah. Um, are there specialty kinds of shade cloth for that, or would you use the same kind of stuff that you use here? Or, you know? I would use something that isn't represented up here, but if you want to walk a little bit, I can find you an older piece that I've just pulled. Um, what you're going to want to use is a black webbing one, and you want to pick. They're going to have the hardest one to find is 25% shade, um, and that's got big spacing and wires on it. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. And then you get 30, and then you get 40, and then you get 60. Um, those, for that kind of thing, if you're putting an awning up, have the best structural integrity to be able to stand up against winds or some extra... Yeah, yeah. Is there any particular place to buy that that you would recommend? I would look for it online. I can't tell you I buy from big... You know, I, from wholesale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, then that should be good. Um, but if you do get it from Greenhouse Supply, you can always call and say, hey, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you're fine. Welcome in. That's how I'm here with everybody, so everybody gets a shot. Um, if you do, you can call Greenhouse Supply and say, I would like an extra edging put in on this, and I would like um, eye holes. I would like to actually get the rivets in there so that I can run connected. To, yep, and that's going to help hold it up. And that's extra expense when you first start off it's going to pay off a million because you're not going to have the thing tearing and ripping and you have to buy another one yeah. so because even for growing tomatoes i'm getting too much sun they oh goodness sun. down on the coast we're down. oh oh, the coast, oh. Mm -hmm. and the afternoon sun is so in very intense. intense and it's humid even more humid than here a lot of yeah. times mm -hmm. yeah so i i absolutely thinking of trying that <laughs> Good. Give it a go. I don't. I don't think that would be a bad thing whatsoever. Make sure that um, 
there's a book called the Red Book, the Greenhouse Red Book, and they have all of the mathematical formulas for how big the greenhouse, how much wind, what kind of slope can you have according to the environment that you're going to put it in for putting up just a little tiny shade structure. They'll probably have some good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's actually, they've got a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch, there's a, a whole series. Uh, they do very, very well. Um, I, I love these structures. They are not growing like you grow outside. So when I'm hanging out with everybody in the garden, we don't always have the same perspective because I'm like, it's in a pot. Yep. And in a pot, you lose two zones of hardiness for yep. cold and two zones of hardiness for hot. And I've got to try to keep these greenhouses just right for them. And I'm putting them in an environment that I've modified. Yeah. I find it really intriguing. I find it very fun. Uh, but it's not the same. You can't always correlate what's going on in the garden yeah. with what's going on in here. Um, but it's a really great starting point. So does, do you have anybody looking to grow something in particular? Or are you looking at greenhouses? Or are you just I as excited as infrastructure as I am? Well, I have a greenhouse. It's a 10 by 14. I think we did a pretty decent job of setting it up based on what you told me. So it's very interesting to hear what you're saying about the heating and cooling and how to go about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I'm going to worry about trying to keep it heated. Mm -hmm. I'm not basically seed starting and that sort of thing, I think. But yeah, we'll yeah, that's we'll yeah, see. that's a whole different level. And like I said, you can get a little heater and it can run on electricity. Right. And you can do that, but make sure you're looking at the fan structure in there because you're going to want to circulate it. Yeah, you really are. Yeah. yeah. yeah and if, get a thermometer because if you're trying to. Load. Yeah. But make sure that it's on the opposite side of the heater on the far back. That's, that's going to be the, the corner that's going to give you the most trouble as far as yeah. temperature control. You want to really try to make sure that you don't have any standing water in there because that's where you're going to get all of the pests. You're going to get pests, and definitely. Keep the air flow so that you're not yep. going to get any air flow. Yep, you don't want standing water anywhere. Yeah, and unless you've got a koi pond filled with mosquito fish, like I do, because they eat all the mosquitoes and all that. Um, but yeah, you really don't want standing water. You, you really don't. It's not even going to make a, a slipping hazard or. Do you guys have any problems with your, with, with bowls or things like or that getting into your... the greenhouses? Um, do we have any problems with bowls? I don't typically have problems with greenhouse with bowls. They, they don't typically come in here. But they're all gravel in here too. So remember I said I got, so imagine their little putty paws trying, no, they're not gonna, yeah. But we had, do we have them in the uh, Juniper Level Botanic Garden? And it is a constant negotiation. Um, what we figured out is that we like foxes and the foxes like us. So we've got a couple families of foxes, and every That's once in a while great. they have a territory battle, and they mark their territory similar to the way coyotes do. So one will poop here, and then the other one will poop right here, and they make this no man's land, okay. and being like, we're living on this side, and you can live on that side. Oh, interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, that's cool. Coyotes do the same thing. So, yeah, we definitely have voles here, but I don't get them, especially because of the way that I've got yeah, the ground the set up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes, sir. I'm interested in subtropical fruit and other edible plants. And I met a guy in the mountains who has a subterranean greenhouse, so he basically dug down. Oh! He's using the ground to heat and getting guavas to fruit with no supplemental heat. That is wonderful. Yeah. Do you have any experience with that kind of setup? I do. Um, I did actually work with two greenhouses when I was out on the West Coast that had that similar setup. And in fact, I've been begging for that here, not because I want it hot, but because I want my cypripediums cold, yeah. right? So that you can use it both ways. Yeah. Um, they work really well. The one that I had, I wasn't there to develop the infrastructure. I know that they had a very similar base to what I've been talking about here with being able to make sure that you've got drainage. Yeah. But the thing I can't tell you about is how to think through what you've got for the land surrounding you. So if you get a big rain or if you get a, another event, you could actually have pressure on the sides of the greenhouse that could cause damage to everything that you've made. No, yeah, water or like land movement. Yeah. So we get water run through here. Come on in, you're okay. We get water running through here and you can see I actually still have a couple of rivets 
This is all from water runoff from rain. Okay. Um, and that's going to be like probably the biggest thing when you're actually sinking that house down. I know I had to go back out there with the shovel and do extra supports. Um, they also had anchors out back. Um, I think it's a great idea. I really yeah. do. But I wasn't there for the installation and I was there to memorize Latin. So, <laughs> so ideally you'd have a drain and in the flatlands you'd probably have to pump the water out, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. he could have, I don't know if he has a drain. I'll ask him. Yeah, I mean, if even if you just put a box in with a basic float valve, so you're going to run a drain through, put it to the box, put a float valve in there, right? So when the float valve gets too high, it kicks on the drain. And those are, are pretty like cheap. You can get them for, yeah, yeah, like a sump pump. You can get them for like 60 or 70 bucks. Okay. Um, but the big thing is that you're also going to need to be able to access that. So you're going to need to be able to check because those pumps don't last forever. And if it's a really wet season, it's going to be running a lot. Yeah. Okay. I recommend a grinder too. Yeah, so not just a basic sump pump, but think about um, what you get in the bottoms of universities when people drop their car keys in the toilet and they've got that big metal grinder to get rid of everything even though you've already flushed it. Uh -huh. uh, they have grinder pumps that would stand up about this high um, and they actually do have a spinning cutting mechanism on there. That means if you've got anything that's a little bigger, like if you get a lot of leaf litter or something like that, or if you do get some mud and things in there, it'll be able to pass it through. I just thought that was really cool. I, I think it's really cool too. Yeah. Like I said, I'm passionate about this. This 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 really excites me. Like there's all these different variables. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, my name's Megan Fiddler. Um, if you ever need anything, uh, just email office at Plant Lights and uh, ask. Say, hey, I saw Megan's babbling way too excited a lecture <laughs> about <laughs> greenhouse infrastructure now I have some extra questions I know ginkgo earrings <laughs> I'm trying to get a hat big enough that I can't fit in any doorway so I have to walk in sideways <laughs> I haven't quite got there yet <laughs> well thank you guys so much like I said feel free if you've got extra questions